everybody. I got a heavyweight sister on the channel today. Oh my God. Man, let me tell you, I found her because she was on another channel. And I said, man, let me see if I can reach out to her. And I reached out to her. I called. I don't know. Somehow she answered the telephone. But then she told me I got to get to her handlers. She got she got people that I got that I got that call me to let me know. That's how heavy she is. She got handlers. <laughs> I don't even have no people. I got to find me some people to get like her. And so uh, check it out, everybody. I want you to do this for me. Subscribe to the channel. And if you've been thinking about it, you was wondering, you didn't hit it. It's free. <laughs> you don't have to pay no money to subscribe. I do this because I want you to know this information. You got to, I, I, I figured out there's a little void. There's other people that do it, but maybe they don't talk like I talk, ask the questions I ask, act like I act. Don't find the people I find, whatever. And, and it's all love. Subscribe to the channel. Like this video, please, because it's going to be good. Watch. Uh, hit that notifications bell, because I'm uploading six, seven videos a week now. I'm, I'm, I'm cranking, and you get a bing or something like that, so you know there's a new video on the channel. And then, and this is easy, tell somebody about us at Strong Inspirations. Would you do that for us, please? Like I said, it don't cost no money. And, and you've been watching them and keeping it to yourself. That ain't right. Tell somebody about us. And then also, just take a minute, really 75 minutes, and watch my movie. I'm a filmmaker, too. So I got this documentary, Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America, talking about slaves that went to college. Slaves who uh, sued for their freedom. Slaves who bought their freedom. It's all in here. And I got black millionaires. People, you, I know you don't know because I didn't know them. It's in my family. And I interviewed some people who uh, family owned the business in the early 1900s. It's in here. And uh, you, can, you can watch it on Amazon. You just go there. You can look at it however you want to, when you want to. Just order it and watch it on Amazon. And then I had so much fun with the movie because I took it to 40 cities on my own dime. I was showing it in the basement of a church. Don't matter to me because they had to get that information. And then I wrote a book on it. And so uh, it's called Black Business Book. The book don't have the interviews, but it's got more facts. And so it's, it's, I'm, I'm telling you, I've had people call me and say, man, I just didn't believe that. Well, look in the back of the book. It tell you where I found it. Uh, it's going to blow you away. I, I promise you that. I even tell people, I guarantee you're going to learn something new. You get your money back. And this is on Amazon too. Or if you want to cut out the big man, you're the Amazon guy, uh, go straight to my website, inspirationsbystrong.com. Because everything I do is strong. I like that word, which stands for, and now this is going to be the intro to the sister, because I know she fit the bill. It stands for strength tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. Sister, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself <laughs> as we say strong. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Brogdon, for that very um, robust and energetic introduction. Um, I, I don't think I've been hyped up like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we do. That's all. Go ahead. Uh, but I, I appreciate that. So um, my name is Kalisha Graves. I'm a higher education educator working in the HBCU sector, uh, teach a couple of cat classes, run a couple of programs. Um, so I am one who is dedicated to committing my life through the particular pathway of educational service. Um, I feel that is where my skill set can be most utilized and sure. maximized. And so pouring into the lives of students and um, helping to extend the grand tradition of what our HBCUs is um, really what I what I enjoy doing right now in my life. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I, and I talk about, I got all the HBCUs in my book. I tell you, yeah. the date they was found, they tell you a little bit of history about them. And then even some white institutions that were accepting mm -hmm. Blacks. But before we go into that, uh, how you get to be who you are? What, what, where you from and, and how you get to like education so much? Yeah, so I'm from North Carolina, um, born and raised right outside Fort Bragg. Um, 
mo some may be familiar with Fort Bragg, um, largest one of the largest military installations. And I am the daughter of parents who were committed in industries of service. My mother had um, two learning centers when I owned two learning centers when I was growing up. My father was an administrator, worked um, in the church. So I grew up around um, or was reared by um, parents who were firmly invested in careers of service. And I, I think really my mother's growing up in a context, growing up literally in learning centers is kind of what inducted me early on in life to the world of learning. I mean, in 2006, I was uh, watching a, a television program with my father called Democracy Now. Okay. And I remember seeing a clip of the Selma to Montgomery march. Okay. And um, I had kind of seen clips before, but what was different this time is that I saw Mrs. Coretta Scott King. And, you know, you, you, I understood, okay, Mrs. King is the wife of Dr. King, but I didn't know that much about her. And oh, sure. for some reason, that clip of the Selma to Montgomery March just turned on um, a, a spark in me to, to research, you know, yeah. about who this woman was. And then by virtue of doing that, that kind of led me into this grand world of exploring the lives of black folks. So, wow, yeah. that's beautiful. So now when you were the kid that got all A's in grade school, you, I know that's who you were, right? <laughs> I, I was, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. I made A's and B's. I did. Yeah. I know how it is. You came out with a three, eight, three, nine, <laughs> out of I, high school. Here, and... I, I, you know, when I went to undergrad, I slacked off a little bit. Um, but yeah, no, Got I, I hang in a little bit here right? and there. And... When I was in college, when I said I slacked off, I wasn't going to class because I was too busy doing research on stuff that I actually wanted to know about. Right. So really? <laughs> I wasn't trying to go to math class and all that because I was somewhere, you know, yeah, in the library trying you. to research about, you. you know, whoever. So, yeah. Now, yeah. now, now what the city you grew up in, there's black history in your city, isn't there? Oh, yeah, indeed. In North Carolina, indeed. give us a story about that uh, Black history. Because you walking past, is it good Black? Is it slavery? I mean, tell us a little bit about some of that in your town. Yeah, so um, Fayetteville, North Carolina, like I said, uh, not far from Fort Bragg. Um, the history that I am most familiar with is the history as it relates to my family within this area. You know, I've been here. Uh, my mother's side of the family been here over... 300 years, really? um, the, um, their downtown in our city, there's a market house and there's been some contention lately over which, what ought to be the future of that market house. But, um, you know, I have documents of, of ancestors having been sold from, from that, uh, particular place. An auction so, um, site in short. Yeah, right, right. Oh, so, really? um, so, but, um, you know, we have Fayetteville State University here, historically black college. Um, North Carolina has um, one of the states that has more HBCUs than um, nearly any other state. Sure. I think the only other state that has close may be Alabama, um, oh, really? uh, Alabama or Texas or something one of those states, but um, yeah, we, one of the states with the most number of HBCUs, um, of course, Fayetteville State University started as a state teacher's college, training teachers for the race. So um, right. this city is, is in good company as it relates to black history. Yeah, and, and then how far are you from Durham and Raleigh where the Black Wall Street was? Right, so Durham is about an hour and a half from Fayetteville. Okay. Um, Raleigh is about 50 minutes. Yeah, because that's that's North Carolina mutual insurance territory there. <laughs> right. No question. And now in your town, were there black businesses? Were there a black neighborhood, a black district, district or something like that? Yeah, so I don't, um, I know there were black businesses. Um, my area of interest as it relates to history is intellectual history, right? Ooh. So specifically African-American intellectual history. Um, a lot of times when we talk about African-American history, we're looking at what black folks have done, um, what were the works that we applied um, in our lives, but rarely are we asking questions about how black folks thought, right? Really? What were, yeah, the, true. What, what were the, the ideas and the streams of consciousness that they were engaging in. So a lot of my work is focused on excavating the intellectual tradition, right? In terms of how black folks exist as thinkers 
in um, this terra firma that we call the United States of America, right? Jeez. What has been um, the trajectory or the trajectories of our consciousness during our sojourn here? But also, I'm interested in the global Africana experience in terms of how African descended people are thinking globally. Yeah. So um, looking at many of the the, the freedom fighters and, and on, on okay. the continent and, and, and in the diaspora external to the United States. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in exploring the minds of black folks. Now, now let me ask you that. that I like this. Now that's, that's good stuff. Uh, what, what do you, I mean, like the minds, okay, you, our, slaves got minds. Right. People don't, people might have, and I think the white man was able to try to uh, psych us out and make us feel that they didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's, that's not the truth. Yeah, no, we, we've been thinkers from the moment. Um, and it's one of the points um, that I make in the book on Dr. Burroughs, right? Yeah, we're going to get to the There's a, book, there's so, a yeah. tradition of Black folks as being thinkers. One of the questions that I start my class out with every semester, I ask my students, when you think of historical African Americans, what words come to mind? Yeah. And, you know, people usually say slavery, you know, yeah, Jim Crow, no suffering, beat down, all of those pathologies exactly. that associate with Blackness, but rarely do they say um, thinker, right? right? Which fundamentally lets me know that when we think about who our people are historically, we don't understand them first as thinkers, right? right? Because if you don't understand yourself as a thinker, then you'll just be a person who moves through time, who is imputed upon right. rather than one who can contribute to, right? right. Rather okay. than one who has impact on space and time. Okay, let me stop you there. Okay, okay, yeah. we're thinking now. I like yeah. this. Uh, can we go back to, I'm in Africa? Right. And... This white guy comes along, but this black guy got me as his, you know, he captured me in a war or something like that. I, I hear all the different scenarios, how they got slaves. And mm -hmm. so now I'm a person and all of a sudden I've been tricked to go on this boat. Mm -hmm. And then when I get to the boat, the bo I got no space. What am I thinking at that time? What can you imagine I'm thinking at that time? Yeah, well, for me, I can imagine that it is an experience through which one's identity is literally um, being squeezed out of them, right? Or the attempt is to squeeze out um, whatever vestiges of my identity that I have left. So I can imagine um, that it, 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 well, we know that it was an extraordinary psychic toll that it, um, that it, that it put on our ancestors, right? The attempt to snuff out our identities, to snuff out our pride, to snuff out courage. Oh, sure. But what we understand is that despite those attempts, we still emerged out of that as conquerors, right? Because no we question. still um, were able to use our mind and apply our minds to, to wrought great works. Um, oh, yeah, this hold on, hold on, let me, this is what I'm, what I'm getting at. Uh, maybe, maybe you just got to got to kind of imagine this. And this is the deep thing. I'm in a slave ship. How do I not die? Mm -hmm. how, how do I live through this? And I'm, I got what, a couple months I'm on this boat and the boat is rocking. How do I, can you imagine that though? What they might yeah. have thought? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, all I can imagine is that it was the sheer force of the will to survive. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it's that and it's that will to survive that is that is endemic to who we are as black people today, right? It's yeah, it's sure. epi it's epigenetic, it's sure. embedded in our memory. It's actually right, the will to survive, that knee-jerk instinct to thrive and to continue is yes. embedded in our DNA um at an epigenetic level in terms of who we are, right? Sure. So I would say that even through that dastardly and ugly experience, what emerges is the will to survive, right? Sure. And that's what okay, you see like resident that. among. Yeah, and, and yeah. that's what's unique about, um, I believe, Black folks today, right? That yeah. sheer knee-jerk um, yeah. um, um, will to survive. Okay, so then you get off the ship and now you in this foreign country. You got mm -hmm. no clue. I guess you're waiting on them to give you some clothes. How do you, how, how do they, how, what's the mindset then? I mean, you know, can you give us something that what they might have thought or how they yeah. overcame that mindset too? Right. I think what we see once African people 
are snatched into this American colonial enterprise, what we see are African people creating communities, right? Okay. Because within that community, you're able to um, maintain psychic or psychological resilience, right? Epistemological resilience. What those communities do is allow African people to preserve their traditions, right? To preserve their traditions against the assaults of the colonial enterprise, right? That would attempt to denigrate and nullify who they are as people. So the way that our people maintain that, um, maintain that Africanity, if you will, maintain that identity and that pride and that courage is by com creating communities through which that resilience could be expressed, right? And, and as you go through the long trajectory of African-American history, you see the expressions of that resiliency, right? Okay. And, and going back to what I was mentioning, my interest in the intellectual part, right? Understanding what are those intellectual currents of resilience that African descended people are manifesting in order to protect who they are, but not only that, demonstrate and carve out um, in this, in, in, in this new world, right? In this yeah, hemisphere okay. to carve out an identity that right. speaks to who African descended uh, people are, yes, right? Okay, it's so unassailable like, identity. Like, uh, excuse me, when they were like in the movie, okay, you beat me because I don't want you, you don't, I, I want to be called Kente Kunte and you don't want to call me that, you're going to call me something else. Mm -hmm. If I'm, and, 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 okay, I say, okay, my name is whatever you call me. Now my name is Harry, okay, whatever, Harry Smith or whatever you call me. Do I then around my own people say, don't call me Harry Smith, please call me Kunte, <laughs> so that I can remain some identity? Yeah. Are there examples of things that they do to me, uh, remain that African yeah. tradition, even under the influence, I'm going to get beat if you catch me? Right. I think what you see among our people in terms of tactics, yes. right, that we use to survive is the ability to adapt. Right. The ability to adapt doesn't mean that you have to fundamentally change. <laughs> I got you. Right? It just means you understand how to navigate this uh, this environment so that we can survive and live to fight another day. So I think what you see in using that example from Roos, what the 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 the, the struggle between Toby and, and Kunta in terms of right. the identity is one understanding that I have to be able to navigate this terrain, right? So that I can survive to live and to fight another day. So, and again, those are currents that you see throughout the um, African experience in this country. Right. Before we, we're going, I'm going to definitely get to the book, but I guess this is really deep, but you got me thinking, and I, I got another question. So if I, uh, I, 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 as I've interviewed people and I hear these stories, there were things that black people were doing to get over on white people. Mm. Like give you an example. I heard that the other day a lady tells me that we want to learn how to read and write. And I know we get a beat down if we have a book. But because them sisters had them long dresses, they had pockets, they hid books in the pockets. Mm. And while they were in the field. Mm -hmm. So they found a way to get, you know, we're going to take, we're going to steal a moment as they, as they called it. And right. or, there were instances where black people would have a book and then a white person saw them and they would turn the book upside down. Now that's some thinking. To mm -hmm. me, they turn and then the yeah. white person said, oh, he don't know what he's doing. He got the book mm -hmm. upside down, but he do know what he's doing. He's just psyching you out. I'm sure right. there's a lot of those type stories that you came across. Well, yeah, our people have always created sites of learning and sites of epistemological exchange, right? Epistemology is just a big word that means knowledge, but our people have always improvised, right? Yeah. Improvised sites improvised spaces where we could share knowledge. Um, and again, whether it's turning the book upside down or, or what have you, these are techniques, these are survival techniques that helps us to navigate the terrain that we're in, right. but it doesn't fundamentally change who we are as a people. And yeah. it doesn't change who we believe we are and what we can accomplish. There's, um, actually I mentioned, there's an example in the book where Burroughs talks about how her grandmother, right, overcame that kind that the the attempt to assault her dignity and to assault her identity. So yeah, our people have. Okay, hold on, this, I, yeah, hold on, hold on, sister. I'm ready. Let's get to the book. Show us the book, and let's go to that example. Yeah. So the book is actually um, it's it's beside me here. 
okay. also here, but it's um, Nanny Helen Burroughs, a documentary portrait of an early civil rights pioneer, 1900 to 1959, published by the University of Notre Dame how, Press. How did you find her? First came out in May 2019. How, how did you mm. find her? Say that again? How did you find her? Right. So I was um, reading another book on somebody else. I want to say it was W.E.B. Du Bois or somebody like that. And I remember seeing her name mentioned. And um, I remember seeing a note about her in the uh, in the footnote. And so for me, I'm the kind of person who's drawn to gaps and drawn to voids, right? If somebody's name is in the footnote, obviously they were important, right? right. Obviously oh, sure. there was some impact there. Sure. So I've always been drawn to the so-called unsung heroes of our, <laughs> sure. okay. of our, our history. So um, I, you know, went to Google, started researching, um, discovered her manuscript collection at the Library of Congress. Um, and her manuscript collection is over 100,000 items. I believe it's 110,000 items. And so when I discovered that, I was like, well, you know, if this woman was this prolific, now, I, I don't when even- you say manuscript items, she, this is stuff she wrote. Right, these are, these are the material productions you know, of her, of her life. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't even know if I have a hundred thousand things that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hundred thousand sure, sheets sure. of paper that I've, I, that I've written sure. on in my life. So, you know, for her to have such a corpus, so for there to be such a, a large body of material sure. on this woman was just astounding. And the fact that there was not and I, a, a strong body of work on her. I mean, scholars have written about her. There have been journal so um, of articles, her, yeah. you know, acad in, in the academic spaces, a couple of dissertations, yeah. as well as um, there was a book that someone wrote on her back in the 1950s, but nothing, yeah. you know, that really kind of uh, was a statement as to who I felt that was a statement as to who well, Burroughs was. was what, what, who was she? What's her, what's her background? Uh, Burroughs, what's her? Yeah, so yeah, she yeah. was, she's born in Virginia, Orange County, Virginia in 1879, 1878, 1879, right after the end of Reconstruction, right? right. Um, so she's born, you know, a little black girl in the South. She's the daughter of um, formerly enslaved parentage. Her mother works in the, uh, in the domestic service. Her father was an itinerant preacher. Um, some say he died. Some say um, he left the family. Scholars debate that point. But what we do know is that he wasn't around for those very early formative years of her life. So her early influences are women. So, you know, effectively her, her grandmother and her mother are those um, early strong forces in her life. She moves to DC at a young age because her mother wants to expand the range of opportunities that are available no, to her. So you say she moved, her and her mother moved. Her mother, right. Her mother yeah. moves, they to move D. to DC um, because she wants to expand again, the bandwidth of opportunities that are available to Nanny. And um, that's kind of where that, that's where her life takes off. She goes to the M Street School in DC. Um, her how, goal, is, how is she at this point? Uh, this is, uh, she, she's, um, uh, in her teenage years. Teenage, okay. Right, right. Or early, you know, early um, preteen years. Okay, I got teen you. Years. I got you. So where she's attending the M Street School and her goal is to teach there one day, of course. She's denied a position at the M Street School. And out of that disappointment, she um, determines that she's going to start a, a school for the women and girls of her race. Oh, and okay. So that's her. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. Like and the school okay. was called the national training school for women and girls. And okay. um, I, that, that was a platform for a lot of her work. She's a huge figure in the national Baptist convention. Okay. Um, in the women's auxiliary to the national Baptist convention. So she's widely involved in a couple of different areas from religion, to, okay. uh, from re religious circles to socio-political circles. Yeah. Now you say you had all this writings. Who, how did she learn how to write and, and, and get her education through that school training or her right, mom right. Really so enforced that right. on her? She goes to, right. So um, she goes to the M Street Colored School and that's where her formative education is is um lived out we don't know much about her personal life oh really okay. um because she didn't 
let on about oh, that. Oh, I got you. I, got you. Um, I, I think she was a person who more or less wanted folks to focus on the work. Okay. Um, and not get bogged down into details about, you know, her. I got you. So, I got you. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, is she, now, are these writings like a, a diary writings? Right. So it's a compilation of different things. So okay. you have speeches, you have articles, she's written letters. Um, um, it, it's, it's a compilation of various types of, of, we can call them data sources, of various types of sources of things that she produced in her life, books, things like that. So, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she wrote a, a book about her life even. She, well, she wrote a couple of different pamphlets um, okay. about um, Christian living. A lot of the pamphlets that you'll see that she produced are in concert with her work in the National Baptist Convention. So, okay, she, I got you, you know, I writing got about you. healthy living and, you know, how to live right. And all oh, that she stuff. wrote about that kind of thing. Oh yeah. She, she's extremely prolific. She, she was, um, she wasn't just narrowly focused on the social issues, right? She, but she's also, um, she sees herself as a missionary, okay. right? She sees her, her first call as, as being a missionary. And so a lot of her work is um, helping folks to come to the knowledge of the gospel and and things like that. So yeah, she's very. Um, I, I call her a grand mosaic of okay, a woman. Okay, okay, a I grand got you. mosaic of a woman because there's so many different facets. When when you read her writing, is it is it uh, is the grammar correct and that kind of thing? Uh, you know, good sentence structure, just so on and so forth. Because like yeah. when you know that that that's the case. Right. So in, in the um, materials that I've read, that is very much the case. Uh, again, this is an educated woman, right? Uh, a, a very um, uh, prodigiously gifted woman, widely gifted. She's mm -hmm. very, she, she's smart. And, and she has, she's the kind of person who um, I call it organic intelligence, right? Um, she, she's just very, very advanced. So when you read her works, um, she is using <laughs> proper sentence structure and, oh, really? and okay. things like that. Yeah. So, okay. um, yeah, very, 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 very gifted woman. Yeah, the reason why I asked that, you know, that, that the book by, uh, I guess it's Carly D. Wilson, The Miseducation of a Negro. Right. When right. you read that, the writing is, <laughs> you got to kind of figure out what he's saying sometimes, you know. <laughs> I don't know mm -hmm. if the sentence structure is completely well, right. Well, a lot of times, you know, you're you're dealing with people who are part of the Victorian period. So sometimes um, sentence structure, the way that they use or, or convey certain ideas may not be immediately familiar to how we might read something today. So what, what I notice is when you read okay. folks like Du Bois or Burroughs or whoever, um, they're using a very sophisticated... Um, structure, language structure, if you will, in terms of how um, they are communicating. Like when you read the souls of black folks, you know what I'm yeah, saying? It, yeah, sure, that's sure. emblematic of that. You sure. can't really, you can't give the souls of black folks to like a five-year-old. Yeah, well, <laughs> right? no question, no it's question. It's very, yeah. it's very sophisticated, but that's emblematic, not only as, of who they are as, as people, but the time period um, that they, that they're part of. Yeah. I, earlier, you you would tell you you led into just a little bit about her grandmother and some intellectual scenario that she did. Yeah, Can you you remember that? Can you go? I like that. One. Oh, what was that about? Yeah. So Burroughs referred to her grandmother, who was a formerly enslaved woman. She referred to her grandmother as a seamstress and a philosopher. Right. Now, again, going back to the premise that African descended people have always been thinkers. It's something to say that a woman who was formerly enslaved, right? The the adjective, the moniker that you use to describe her is that of being a philosopher. And I found that to be really specific and unique. Um, and she did that because her grandmother had a very particular way of seeing the world, right? And it's this dynamic that impacted how, um, how Nanny would in turn see the world. Actually, as a matter of fact, yeah. let me read a quote from her oh, grandmother yeah, oh, yeah, definitely please i think it will highlight how sophisticated in terms of thought her grandmother was she yes. said yes honey i was in slavery but i wasn't no slave this is maria poindexter speaking the grandmother of nanny helen burrow she said i was she said yeah honey i was enslaved but i wasn't no slave i was just in it that's all 
they never made me hold my head down and there was a whole passel of Negroes just like me. My great grandmother used to use that word passel, right? Which means a lot. She said, we just couldn't be broke. We obeyed our masters and our mistresses and we did our work, but we just kept on saying that deliverance will come. We ain't no hung down head race child. We po, but we proud. She used to tell Nanny all the time, hold your spirit up inside child, hold your spirit up. And that helps you to hold your head up. Don't let your spirit be down. I used to hold my head up so high that sometimes they would say, Maria, why don't you just look down at the ground? And I would say, look down at the ground for what? I ain't no groundhog. I'm looking up at God because that's what he made me for. Honey, here's, the, here, here's where the philosophy gets deep. Honey, they slaved my body, but they didn't slave my mind. I was thinking high of myself. And someday we colored folks is going to live high, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what Burroughs' grandmother achieves with that, right? What she achieves with that is a valuation of herself that does not need to be affirmed by the white world in order for it to be true. Okay. Right? Yeah. Right? So remember, she, she, she's in an, so her existential context, right? Her existential context her existence is that of an enslaved woman but her epistemological and her cerebral existence is that of somebody who cannot be bound by change right so in other words this little existential reality don't mean nothing because this is not who i am oh, I like I, she it. said i was thinking high of myself because that's what god made me for so burroughs's grandmother what and and what she imprints upon Nanny is this idea that your identity, that you are somebody, that you have innate dignity, not because it has to be validated or proven by the white world first, but yes. because that's what God made you for, right? Yes. God is the one who imprints upon you your identity, right? Yes. And calls like you a it. child of God and, 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 and brings you in, 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 into the family. So again, Burroughs' grandmother, a formerly enslaved woman who she refers to as not only a seamstress, right? She wasn't just working with her hands, but she was working with her mind. And she imprinted upon Nanny a strong sense of identity and pride about who she was as a woman. And she helped her to understand that, look, you, our, the immediate path of our application in terms of, of work may be that we have to work with our hands, right? But never forsake the use of your mind. I like it. Never, I like never it. allow your identity to be assaulted by whatever the outside world says, right? I like it. You are somebody because God made you so first. I got so, you. Let me ask you um, this. Anyway, I, I, yeah, yeah I like that, that, I like that was a whole Was she a, yeah. a sharp dresser or something like that? Because she kept her, Who, uh, I'm talking about Nanny. Oh, yeah. She was yeah, clever. She was, she was, yeah, yeah she, she was on point. Yeah, she was sharp. If you uh, if you find some photos of her, and actually the photo of the book, um, yeah, that, um, that's what I was thinking about. Here, yeah, she looks pretty good. Yeah, there. Very, very Victorian, very um, um, upright in terms of how she presented herself. That was one of the things she emphasized at her school, right? The Bible, the bath, and the broom. Right, the Bible because you need to live right, you need to be righteous. The bath because you need to look right, you need to have a certain dignity about yourself. And then the broom because you need to understand how to keep your surroundings clean, right? So oh, that was part okay. of her, her mission at her school, the Bible, the bath, and the broom. But in terms of her personal disposition yeah. and how she showed up in the world, she was very sharp, very oh. sharp. She did didn't she, cut no corners. And did she, dress, a, she didn't cut any corners in dress or in, uh, or in deed. Did she get accolades? Did people did people hear about her? Did, yeah. did she speak on the stage with Frederick Douglass or people, you know, nationally know about her school? How, how, how high did she go? Yeah, so Dr. Dr. Burroughs is extremely well known during her lifetime. Extremely well, she, well she, known, she, right? she got her doctorate? Well, she, um, Shaw University gave her an honorary doctorate. Okay, I, I think got it was you. 1940. I got you. So I got you. nevertheless, yeah, yeah, her cool. life that's cool. I like it. I like yeah. it. Yeah, so she received an um, honorary doctorate later. But no, she's extremely well known during her time. Um, she has a running column in the Pittsburgh Courier for some 30 years. Okay, I like she, it. Um, you know, Dr. King looks to her as, as, as the kind of mentor. She knows his parents, and you'll see an exchange of letters um, 
between them. So uh, Carter G. Woodson, right? The father of Black History Month. Carter yes. G. Woodson, the found, you know, yes. the founder of Asala and all that. Yes. He calls her the world's most scintillating Negro woman leader, right? So oh. she's well, you know, she's well known, but she's friends with, I mean, Booker T. She's in organizations with Booker T. Washington's wife. She, uh, one of the presidents of the United States, calls upon her to oh, to okay. do a, okay. a, a, a fact finding commission. So. Yeah, she's extremely well known like during it. her lifetime. The lapse in her um in her notoriety happened happened, you know, later. But while she was living, she was a dynamic force that everybody knew about. <laughs> and and then as we come to a close, what, what what how did she die? What how did it how did it did the school go for a long time? How did how did they yeah. kind of end for? Right. So she dies in nineteen sixty one. I don't know, um, and I can't recall what the circumstances were around her okay. passing but i know she's she's in her 80s i believe it was when oh, she really? passes um so i mean imagine someone born in 1878 79 living until 1961 all of the things that so that's 80 she, years like you say 80 some years yeah like yeah so okay. everything that she saw in her lifetime so um i don't know the exact circumstances of her passing but her school existed up until about 2006 Sixth, I believe it was, oh. and um, in and Washington D.C. Right, right, okay. and when it closed, um, it was a grade school. I believe it was an elementary school. So, oh, okay. yeah. Have you mm -hmm. met any of her descendants? No. So, um, Nanny Helen Burroughs was never married, and she never had children. Oh, oh okay, so, okay. Right. So there, there were no descendants for me to be able to. Yeah, I got um, you talk to so and and you know if there's any cousins or anything like that um i you know, you know i wasn't yeah. able to track them down so because yeah. again like i said she kind of kept her life um yeah, to I herself. Got you. the book is available on amazon yes amazon it's available through barnes and noble it's available through the university of notre dame press so everywhere books are sold yeah um it's available in hardback and in ebook so um oh, if you want to yes. get it quick you can get it you know via ebook kindle nook all that stuff yeah, good. Well, hey, I thank you so much for for being on the channel with us. Yeah, um, thank you. No, this is great. Yeah, you 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 are uh, you got me to thinking. <laughs> I'm gonna be more intellectual. This sister back there writing back in the in, in the early uh, 1900s. Uh, yeah, I, I like to write, but I got to make sure my sentence structure is good. <laughs> look, look, and I'll say this. You know, you have the example of Nanny Helen Burroughs, but there's a lot more. From where she came from, right? So Anna yeah. Julie Cooper, Mary Church Terrell, Josephine oh, St. Pierre Ruffin, you know, jo Josephine Turpin Washington, um, uh, Maria Stewart, Mary McLeod Bethune, Charlotte Hawkins Brown. Yeah, some I of mean, them names I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. So she's in good company, right? Yeah. So she's, not, she's an example, but she's in good company. So um, yeah. again, part of the work we have to do is to lift up yeah um, these women so that more folks can know about them yeah that's beautiful because and then the other thing is this is a, a, a women's history month right am i saying that right is women's yeah history? that's right yeah this women's history month so this is perfect oh yeah uh, to talk about this sister who mm -hmm. uh and she used all three of her names right. she, uh, did you just come up with that no, that that she that's the name she used, Nanny Helen Burroughs. So yeah. she didn't. She sometimes didn't. I mean, sometimes the letters you would see people refer to her as Nanny Burroughs, or but yeah, Nanny H. Burroughs, Nanny yeah, Helen Burroughs. Yeah, that's beautiful. But most women during that time had the three name thing going on. Mary oh, Church Terrell. Right? Yeah, Mary Church Terrell, Anna Julia Cooper, Mary McLeod Bethune, Ida B. Wells Barnett. They they had them long. Yeah, names oh, I see. Right? I yeah. see. I see. I yeah. see. Well, hey, thank you so much for being on Strong Inspirations yes, and thank everybody. You. Let me tell you, I tell you, I, this is what I do here at the channel. I, I, I didn't even know about this sister that she's talking about, but I luckily found it because I want you to know all this history that I can finally find to present it to you in the best way. And that's to let the people who know tell it, right? I, 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 as you've heard me say, I give it to you straight, no chaser. So come on, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button on the video, hit the notifications bell, tell somebody about Strong Inspiration. Get this sister's book. She put her heart and soul in that and she's uplifting you when you read it. I'm sure that's the mantra of that book. And thank you so very much for being on the show. And so yeah, I say you. to you, I want you to stay strong, stay safe,
Stay on your grind. Uh, we thank you so very much for being on this channel. Everybody, we, thanks for watching. Have another day. Good day. We out. Bye-bye.